Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our first panel, Global Challenges and Trends. This panel will be moderated by Jillian Tett, U.S. Managing Editor, Financial Times. She's joined by panelists Dr. Mo Ibrahim, Chair and Founder, Mo Ibrahim Foundation, Andrea Mitchell, Chief Foreign Affairs Correspondent, NBC News, His Excellency Yousef al Taiba, Ambassador of the United Arab Emirates to the United States, and Darren Walker, President of the Ford Foundation. Well, good morning, everybody, and good morning, everybody, and welcome to the first panel of today's conference entitled Global Challenges and Trends. I think you could subtitle it Economics Without the Numbers. Um, we heard earlier from Chairman Hochberg that jobs are about far more than just the numbers. Well, economies are about far more than just the numbers. They're also founded on cultural systems, political systems, social fabric. So what we're going to be looking at in this morning's panel is really what are the bigger underlying cultural, social, and political themes right now that you all in the room should be looking at to try and work out where the global economy is going. What are the kind of issues that the wise folk at the IMF tend not to talk about when they're trying to draw up their projections for the future of the global economy in the next few years? And we have a terrific group of people to talk about this. Um, just to identify them so that you know who they all are, because they're not wearing name tags or they don't have name labels, at the far end of the panel, on my far left, to your right, we have Dr. Mo Ibrahim, who is chair and founder of the Mo Ibrahim Foundation, a philanthropic body. But he's very interesting indeed for this panel because he spent much of his life um, in the digital world, in the telecommunications world, essentially selling, I think, 24 million phones to 14 countries in Africa. So he's at the very center of some of the technological disruptions shaping our world. And as a Sudanese-British um, citizen, he has also been hopping borders. Next to him is Andrea Mitchell, someone who needs almost no introduction at all um, as the chief international correspondent of NBC News, spends much of her life at the forefront of some of the big changes. Next to her is Ambassador El Altaibi, um, Al who is the ambassador to the United States Embassy in the United Emirates. He again is very much at the front line of big political changes and geopolitical changes right now. And on my immediate left, your right, is Darren Walker, president of the Ford Foundation, who is looking at how philanthropy is reshaping some of the bigger economies. But I'd like to start, please, with Dr. Ibrahim and ask you, if you were to identify two or three of the really big themes that you're watching right now that we should all be thinking about, about where the global economy is going, what do you think is top of your list? Uh, I think the first uh, theme is probably no theme at all. Uh, we walk into uncharted waters. A lot of change, things are changing around us we find it difficult to comprehend uh, what is really going around us. We had a very orderly world in the 20th century. 21st century is, is really uh, quite complicated as it seems. Uh, We've gone global, uh, but uh, our governments and policies uh, are still in national silos. Uh, we have this uh, 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 really uh, probably between business gun global and uh, rules and uh, interests are still very much national and that taxation issue for example uh, came uh, as a result of that uh, is not the American century for sure but it's not the Chinese century it's not the African it is everybody's centuries we hope because Everything around us uh, uh, is moving forward. This is the era where it takes five years to create a company like Uber. Five years ago, we didn't, uh, there was no Uber. Today's value is valued at what, 50, 60 billion dollars or more, uh, 50 countries. It's very easy now for entrepreneurs to start a business and in three or four years, they're all over uh, the world attracting huge valuation. Uh, I can see some great companies here, General, you know, GE, General Electric, and, uh, 
uh, how many years it took General Electric to become a global company. It takes you maybe 100 years. It's different now. And uh, that, I think, is uh, uh, another uh, uh, important thing. The final one, which I want to raise, really, uh, the rules of engagement are changing. Civil society is rising. Uh, the revolution in communications and social media meant that everybody is exposed now. Uh, now, there is questions being asked of business on issues like human rights, abuses, etc. Uh, these things are no longer acceptable. And we need to watch out for corporate governance besides the normal governance issues we have because it's no longer accept what used to happen before is no longer acceptable now. Right. And that puts a spotlight on our business people and our business communities and they need to respond to that. Right. Well, we're going to return to that issue about governance later on because that's incredibly important. But, I mean, you've raised some fascinating issues there. National borders are essentially crumbling or rather you have a dislocation between global business and national borders. It's no longer America's century. America is no longer the central pole. But as of yet, nobody else is the central pole. It's a multipolar world. If you're optimistic, it's the world of the G20 or the G200. If you're pessimistic, it's the world of the G0, to use Ian Brimmer's <laughs> famous phrase. But that's another theme I'd like to come back to. Um, entrepreneurship is shaking everything up. And then, of course, we have the rise of civil society. Now, if you put that together, that sounds quite optimistic and positive. But Andrea, are you feeling optimistic? I tend to be an optimist, even though I've been a reporter for so many years. But uh, it I think reporters are professional cynics. Yeah. It, it becomes increasingly difficult. Let me just say that uh, one of the things that is most noteworthy is the change in our Congress, the gridlock, and the change in the kind of people who come into public service, uh, and the, the role of money in our politics. All of this has evolved over the years. When I first came to Washington in the 1970s, uh, there was a different climate about getting things done. And we've had different types of chief executives. But the biggest change, I think, has been in the legislative arena. And the fact that so little is accomplished in terms of budgets, appropriations, regular order, if you will. Uh, the kind of people in both political parties who used to be in the Senate when I first was covering the Senate in the 1980s and early 90s. Uh, before I went back to cover another White House administration. Uh, it, there was, you know, the, the determination to get things done. When George Herbert Walker Bush agreed to the Andrews Air Force Base Budget Summit, he knew that it was going to be in conflict with his campaign, no new taxes pledge from his convention speech. And he ultimately knew at the time that that was likely going to condemn him to one term. But he also was persuaded by his Treasury Secretary, by the late Dick Darman and others, that it needed to be done. And he had the leadership of Howard Baker and Bob Dole and others on the Hill, and Democrats as well, George Mitchell, that it needed to be done and that we needed to have some sort of budget regularity. Uh, there were moments more recently, I believe, with Simpson Bowles, moments that, that came and, and were missed for that kind of bipartisan approach. And I think we've now devolved into a situation of gridlock. Look at the current negotiations and discussions on the Hill about trade, where international players have to wonder increasingly whether agreements negotiated with the United States uh, can even be, be carried out. Iran and the talks in Lausanne that I covered uh, more recently, which have now resumed at a lower level in Geneva, not at the foreign minister's level, but Kerry and Zarif are going to be meeting at the United Nations Monday afternoon uh, to try to see if something can be done before June 30th. But this all raises questions about the role of the chief executive, the role of Congress, and the reliability of American right. negotiations. I think the failed Middle East peace negotiations, the growth of ISIS, getting to uh, your comment about the, the breaking down of borders, non-state actors, yes. uh, which we first saw, of course, with Al-Qaeda, but now are seeing 
um, most ominously in uh, Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula in Yemen, and now with ISIS or ISIL or whatever you want to call it, the, the inability of Iraq to create a functioning government after the American withdrawal. The threats, the Taliban threats in Afghanistan, as the U.S. now uh, stays longer than this administration had wanted. Um, the overwhelming refugee crisis in Jordan and on other borders to Syria. The failure, uh, because frankly the media now are not, conventional media cannot get into Syria. Those freelancers who risked it after the beheadings are no longer attempting it. There is, there is no visibility to what is happening with the Assad regime. Uh, the role of Iran. Can you wall off the nuclear negotiations from Iran's other behaviors around the world? I mean, all of these are problems uh, that I think even looking back, uh, I know it sounds uh, foolish to be nostalgic for the Cold War oh, boy, yeah. environment that I first <laughs> covered. I covered eight years of Ronald Reagan's presidency, and it did seem a little, uh, in retrospect, it seems easier that we, we were dealing with um, well, as a journalist, it was a lot easier to create a graphic explaining who were the different sides back in the days of the Cold War. If you're trying to create a map showing what's it's going on today, trying to fit that onto a web page or a newspaper is incredibly hard. Well, we're no longer at that nuclear hair trigger, but we're now at um, a level of uh, real concern about the destabilization right. around the world. I'm not even speaking to the economic issues and uh, the issues right. that China represents, and what intelligence officials tell me is the greatest threat, which is cyber war right. and cyber defenses. So those are all things of, of grave concern, um, just to say that uh, the political process here is so uh, in need of reform right. that so I don't see how we overcome some of these challenges in the immediate future. So again, threats to American leadership um, or the ability of America to do things coupled with a lot of instability across the world. Well, that's quite a Debbie Downer, as they might say in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> Ambassador, can you make us feel cheerful again since you're sitting in a part of the world that people like Andrea um, are particularly concerned about? Bail me out here. Thank you. Uh, and the Financial uh, Times, of course. First, let me thank Chairman Hogwarts for the invitation. Uh, very, very kind of you and very honored to be here. I met my fellow panelists earlier in the day and I can assure you that I am the least qualified person on the panel today, so if you want to ch check your email or your Twitter feed, I will not be offended. <laughs> um, on a positive note, let me tell you how things look from the UAE. And let's focus on the economy because if we get into the policy and security environment, I'm going to be worse than Andrea. The UAE is a country of nine million people, but has somehow managed to become the second strongest economy in the region. Um, nine million people of only one million citizens is the US's largest trading partner for the last six years in a row, larger than Saudi, Egypt, and Israel. The UAE was born in a certain geographic location, and that gave it a certain ability to exploit our proximity, uh, proximity to Africa, Asia, and Europe, and it was blessed with resources, oil and gas, which we produce almost three million barrels a day. But it's how you use those advantages to, to improve your economy, to improve your society, to offer jobs, to offer opportunities to young people. One of the most interesting things I've heard in the last few years is if two cities in India want to trade with each other, it's easier and faster for them to trade through Dubai for their goods and services to go through Dubai, to go through another Indian city, than it is to go directly. If you are traveling from the United States today, it's easier to get on a plane and go to a variety of about 40 different locations in Africa than to go directly, to go through Abu Dhabi or Dubai. The way we see it, the way Singapore and Hong Kong were the engines for growth in Asia in the past several decades, Abu Dhabi and Dubai are becoming the growth engines for the Middle East today. Despite the turmoil, despite the insta instability and unpredictability, I see a tremendous amount of untapped potential in the Middle East. There's entrepreneurs, there is young spirit, there is a desire to do things, to, to improve the places where they live. And I think we have to find a way to harness that potential the way the UAE has become, in many ways, the success story of the Middle East. 
So do you think we should be looking instead at the issue of cities and trading hubs rather than nation states? I, I can see that Dr. Ibrahim is nodding enthusiastically at that, but I'm curious to hear from you, Ambassador, and then perhaps Dr. Ibrahim as well. I think business generally gravitates towards what makes sense for them. And so today, there is more cargo and passengers flying through UAE uh, than anywhere else in the Middle East because we've made it easy. So I think the more we can encourage and develop places to open up and embrace the open market society, there are certain advantages we can gain from just going where it makes sense. And, and Jabal Ali is a great example. Jabal Ali today is the largest port in the Middle East, but it's the third largest re-export market in the world. Uh, again, this is a country that is the size of the state of Maine with only one million citizens. So it can be done. We just have to find better ways to actually encourage that kind of growth. Well, certainly Singapore shows the way that the geopolitical landscape can change sometimes in unexpected ways. Um, but Dr. Abraham, I see you nodding at the idea that cities are perhaps, or trading hubs are where yes. we should be looking. And I'll turn I, really, I really need to link these two points. You raised a very important point about the rise of the non-state actors. Uh, what we see, a number of non-state actors are rising now. And it's not just ISIS or the, the Boko Haram and, the, and you know, this kind of, uh, in all fields around us, in, in philanthropy, we see people like Bill Gates and other people there are really exercising a huge uh, uh, forces for change. They, they lead on the global fund, they lead, and they push countries or pull countries behind them. Uh, then cities, cities actually are leading on, on, on climate change. They are more able than states or the countries to implement policies and go forward. Decision making, effective, and moving forward. So we can see how this new alliance of the cities, the C40 or whatever, can become really a very powerful uh, global force for change and decision making. Uh, entrepreneurs, the business, I just mentioned uh, people the starting business and going global overnight, uh, changing the way we see things and we do things. So this is this rise of non state actors is one of the major trends we can see uh, right. in front of us. I mean, the rise of non-state actors can be read in two ways. So you can either say it's the rise of non-nation state actors. It's no longer about nations per se. We have yeah. to rethink some of our concepts. Or you can say it's no longer just about the public sector. And we need to rethink the way we put the public sector, the private sector, and the non-governmental sector into different boxes. Um, or the business sector, but um, it seems a good moment to bring in Darren from the Ford Foundation because you are one of the non-state actors, I think. You do you feel like a non-state actor? On this panel, I do. Mm -hmm. I will say <laughs> that, first of all, thanks to the chairman for in including me and, of course, to be in, in the company of his esteemed mother, Lillian Vernon, one of the great women business leaders in the history of American <laughs> commerce and enterprise is a great treat for me. But I've just returned from India, and I'm actually very hopeful. I'm hopeful because there are two things going on in that country that I think represent the future. One is the growth of global philanthropy. India has leapfrogged over the UK to become the third, <coughs> number three, in global rankings of the number of billionaires behind the United States and China. And it's they're likely to catch up with the United States and China. Those newly wealthy people are turning to what they should do for their society. They're looking to America, actually, because American-style philanthropy, pioneered by John D. Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie, really have set the stage and the tone for how people everywhere think about philanthropy. The other thing that is happening is the growth of a vibrant corporate social responsibility philosophy there. In fact, the government has, has mandated that companies, Indian companies, spend 3% of earnings on corporate social responsibility activities. So what this has created is this 
this exciting uh, ecosystem of innovation where corporate leaders, corporations are looking to partner with philanthropy and civil society to improve the lives of ordinary Indians. And so I think what is going on there is hugely exciting. It portends for much of the rest of the developing world a trend of, of more philanthropy, more wealth being created and, and being harnessed for social good. So I'm actually quite enthusiastic and, and hopeful right. in spite of what Andrea said. I mean, <laughs> well, journalists, as I say, are trained to be professional cynics. We are always the Debbie Downers of any panel. Um, that's our job. But um, I'm curious, I mean, would you agree with this idea that we need to rethink where some of the motors for change are coming from? It's not just state or business, that perhaps we need to look at a breaking down of the barriers between philanthropy, business, government? Well, I think that, uh, as you just suggested, that in looking at Warren Buffett, Gates and his foundation, Melinda and, and Bill Gates, and the trend toward uh, philanthropists getting involved in the HIV AIDS and then Ebola and other transmittable diseases, uh, as well as infrastructure in some of the African countries uh, and in Asia. I think that those trends and the corporate responsibility that you just referenced, as well as um, the whole Warren Buffett Gates notion of taking your, yeah. your inheritance and turning it over um, is a, a profound change in the way that not just the Rockefellers and the Carnegies, but the, the current generation and uh, the, the great wealth in Silicon Valley yeah. exemplifies it. So if that is now also being modeled in India, it is indeed a source of great, great optimism. I just think that on the bigger geopolitical issues that they require to be nation states who can perform the, the security functions that create the proper environment for business to function well and for cross-border trade to be open and, and free. And that that is still a challenge for government that has not been addressed by, and cannot be really addressed by the private sector. Right. I think Ambassador. I, I think in some cases it's already happening. This hybrid between working between governments and philanthropy or private sector. One case is in the UAE. We met with Bill Gates a few years ago and he was explaining to us that he's having a difficult time getting his polio eradication program into parts of Pakistan. And he's struggling because of you know, Western uh, exposure in Pakistan. So the Abu Dhabi government partnered with the Gates Foundation for $50 million to allow UAE government services to offer the Gates Foundation initiative in Pakistan. So it's being offered through the UAE for because we have a you know historical relationship with Pakistan, but here you have a relationship between a government and the Gates Foundation to eradicate polio in Pakistan that has been wildly successful. So I think in some cases there is a model for that kind of thing. You have to go to your strengths. In, in the UAE, for example, the strength is the strength of the, the government and the funding of the government. We've worked with foundations like Gates and many others to, to solve problems, not just in our country, but in the region. So I think that model exists. It, I, would, I would strongly suggest it should be encouraged. Right. Let me just add to that. The, the, the back story, though, is, of course, the reason why there was so much suspicion of vaccination is because the CIA used a doctor who was attempting to do vaccinations for polio as the ruse to get into the Abbottabad compound and try to get DNA to, make, to find out whether Osama bin Laden was yeah. hiding there. And that became a source of you know, huge controversy and it, it, it infected, uh, pun intended, yeah. the whole climate of vaccinations. So tragically, it's, it, tragically, I mean, yes. it, it, it's extraordinary that the UAE was able to come yeah. to the rescue there. No, but, it's very, very impressive. But I must say, this question about you know, who are the biggest drivers of change is fascinating. Um, I was actually chairing a panel last week at the World Bank meetings, um, which was discussing the Sustainable Development Goals, 
which are supposed to shape emerging market um, development for the next 15 years, not just in areas like health, but also infrastructure, um, building power plants, things that many people in the room would be very interested in, in participating in. Um, and Jeffrey Sachs um, broke in at one point and said, well, actually, maybe we shouldn't be asking the governments for help because Western governments are cash-strapped. Maybe we should be tapping up the 1,400 billionaires in the world and, you know, I will be, we can send them emails and ask them for money instead. And it's very much part of the shift away from traditional models of development to thinking about other ways to spur global growth. Um, but Dr. Ibrahim, irrespective of whether you're going to get a call from Jeffrey Sachs soon to help with this project, um, this obviously raises big questions about governance, doesn't it? Absolutely. And uh, it's just to respond, I mean, uh, to the first point about the billionaires, I mean, you have something give the giving pledge here. We have like 130 people who committed to give half their money during the... Uh, uh, so some people are acting and uh, we, we, we notice that the majority of them actually are, are Americans. So this is uh, uh, a statement really about the generosity of the, in the DNA of the American uh, philanthropist. Uh, we have to accept that. Uh, global governance, I, I go back to the... I, I think we have a problem. And we need to face to face to it because if you look at the issue of, of, of global governance around us, let us start at the top level. Uh, we have institutions uh, where which these multilateral institutions is their legitimacy started to be questioned. Okay, you, you look at the United Nations, and let us be frank: the United Nations represented the result of the Second World War. In Security Council, we have Britain and France. We don't have Germany or Japan. Each of these two countries are bigger economically, population, whatever, than France and Britain. They are not in Security Council. India is not in Security Council, although have population, which is four times the two countries added together. So what exactly Security Council represents? What legitimacy has it got? Uh, it's a question. We, you, do you remember about 15 years ago, Kofi Annan started to talk about the reform of the United Nations? Did you hear any, any discussion about reform of UN since then? No. no. The powers that be just push this under the carpet. People pretend we still live in 1946. And uh, no, this is a completely different time. And by failing to really accept the reality of a change, we are delegitimizing our most important institution. The IMF, I think it was wrong for the American Congress to accept the change in the voting rights. That damaged the IMF. This means the IMF really is an American institution, is not a global institution. What happens then? China go and start its own bank. Actually, China started two banks, not only the infrastructure bank, but also started the, uh, uh, this uh, BRICS bank, another development bank there. And even Britain and Germany signed up now to this infrastructure bank. So what is going to happen here? We are going to destroy the multilateral institution which we have. And that because we refuse to recognize that the world has changed. We still think in the same terms that we really run the whole world from here, from the Capitol or the White House. We don't. We don't. The world is much bigger than anybody. And we have to accept the others. If we don't accept the others, the others will go and form their own camp. And then what will happen? The governance is broken. We need to accept that. Look at the leadership of the IMF. Of the, why the IMF has always to be run by a French man or a French woman? What happened to the rest of us? I mean, what's wrong with, with other people? <laughs> so, I, I, we really need to, uh, to, to deal with that. Well, you can ask that to, the, um, to Madame Lagarde later on this morning. <laughs> no, Christine is a wonderful woman. She's a friend of mine. I love her to bits. But truth, we have to speak the truth. 
So the question then is... It's, I mean, not, it's not a question of club because she's a friend I, I have. No, it's wrong. Right. So the question then is, I mean, although we've not seen any serious debate about reform of the UN or IMF, what we have seen is something very tangible, as you point out, Dr. Ibrahim, the rise of the BRICS Bank and the Asian Infrastructure Bank. Um, that has provoked lots of concern here in Washington. Do you think that's a good or bad thing? I'm an ambassador. Do you think we should be welcoming the fact that we have the world changing, tipping on its axis, and the rise of the Asian Infrastructure Bank and things like that? Or should we be seeing this instead as a signal that places like America need to get their act together and try and forge ahead? I, I think everything in the economic space is competition. And if there is an Asian infrastructure bank, as long as it plays by the same rules as the rest of everyone else, there is no reason that, com that competition should not be encouraged. Uh, we, we were always taught in here that competition is a healthy thing. And so as long as everyone's playing by the same rules, I believe that competition is a good thing and will probably promote more growth and more of opportunities that I'm talking about and will focus on some areas that maybe some previous banks have not focused on. So yeah, I think by all means. Can I yeah. just return to something you said earlier about the role of non-state actors and the growth of non-state actors? Because I think the comment about Jeff Sachs at the, in the SDG meeting, I think it's naive to believe that we can have a vibrant, robust, global economy without strong, vibrant governance. I mean, to, to imagine a world where we just think that philanthropy and corporations can together figure out how to solve problems while we allow the atrophication of our governments is, is completely naive. Right. And so what worries me about those kinds of comments, and Jeff certainly knows from his own experience, the limitations of thinking that that philanthropy or the academy can go into a country and with the World Bank change things without understanding the fundamental issues of governance in a country is just simply naive. And that's why civil society matters so much. Because why would a room of important business people care about civil society in, in, in Africa or Asia? Because civil society wants the same thing business people want. They want transparency. They want accountability of government. They want standards. They want rule of law. These are all things that any business person is going to want to ensure that their contract is enforceable. Right. Well, a human rights person is going to want it because they want to make sure that before the law, all citizens are treated, treated equally. So I think we can't, we can't become so excited and start to fetishize the idea of, of non-state actors, right. because there's a real danger there. So, memo to any government bureaucrats in the audience, we still love you, yeah. and we need you. <laughs> Andrea. Uh, I also think that we should focus a bit on China, on, on the challenges that <clears throat> Xi Jinping is facing, the, the enormity of what he is trying to achieve in moving that society economically, culturally, socially. Uh, the slowing growth needs to be a cause of concern. 7% uh, sounds awfully good from where we're sitting here, but it's not good in the, in the Chinese context. And uh, just the changes that we are seeing from China and its relationship in the world around it, I think is another you know, major issue, and Putin. Uh, yes. I'm persuaded that, that uh, Merkel and Europe would not have really crack down on Putin over Ukraine if not for the airliner, that that is what had to galvanize the European societies. Because up until that, that stage, it was an American initiative, but not an American initiative that was really welcomed by Europe because of Gazprom, because of the energy dependence, because of the trade deals. And um, the American, the, the changing climate also in oil supplies and in what the American production, the new, more recent American production levels have met in terms of our you know, eventual moves, especially once we have um, the ability to transport 
Absolutely, what we're yes. producing overseas. Well, that, so I just think that these are all emerging factors. Um, right. Vladimir Putin and his recent four-hour news conference slash speech had a, n a number of really ominous messages, including his hegemony over all of Ukraine, which he declared, and his reference to nuclear defenses. Right. Um, well, that really brings me on to the last question I really want to ask you, which is none of you are actually doing what many people in the, in the room today are doing, i.e. business. I mean, Dr. Ibrahim, for many years you were in business. You built a fantastic cell phone um, group. Um, you've actually been at the sharp end of dealing with the messy business of doing business. Um, but I'm curious that, and maybe because you're not in business today, you can actually talk about it more freely. If you had one place or one sector in the global economy today that you think holds out tremendous promise over the next decade, and one place which you would not touch even if someone paid you to do so, or one country, um, what would it be? Maybe Dr. Ibrahim, you can start. Yeah, I, uh, I come from the telecom industry, so always I have a soft spot for technology. But uh, we continue to do investments, so I'm not out of business. I'm still doing business in Africa, but, but now as an investor, uh, more than running my own company. And uh, the one place I invest in is Africa. I mean, I don't invest anywhere else. Uh, for a simple reason, uh, Africa offers the highest return. Okay, so it's just, it's just, although of course my heart is there, but my wallet is there as well. And it's wonderful when you have your heart and your wallet in the same direction. <laughs> um, That's a happy coincidence. So, <laughs> so anyway, that, that, uh, that, that, that we do. Uh, Africa is, is, is hungry, hungry for a lot of things. We have a huge rising middle class, two or three hundred million people uh, joined the middle class recently. This is huge consumption uh, right. uh, coming on. People need better housing, better transport, even Fred's uh, fire trucks, you know, or whatever is selling there. And, you know, everything is needed. And uh, 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 it's a great opportunity to do business. And I'm, I'm always surprised how American business people have become Amer Africa shy. I, I don't understand why. Uh, some years ago, U.S. was the largest trading partner for, uh, of Africa. I mean, you look now, Europe is still the biggest trading partner of Africa, very, very closely uh, uh, followed by China, in a distant, distant third place at probably half the amount of trade uh, those guys doing comes United States. And I don't understand why when Africa was in a difficult spot, the American business was there. Right. Uh, now you go to Africa, you go to the bar in the evening or the restaurants, I don't, I don't hear English. I hear Chinese, I hear Brazilian, I hear Indian, Hindu, whatever. Right. I don't know what's your problem. I mean, you're afraid of Ebola or afraid of... Uh, <laughs> I don't know what, you, what, what is your problem there, but that, as a businessman, that suits me very well. Right. Because <laughs> okay, so go to go to Africa. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Andrea. Uh, well, I'll, uh, obviously, the telecommunications explosion is the most extraordinary um, revolution that we've seen, at least in, in modern times. I think looking forward, also genetic exploration and medical technologies, which could end up bankrupting us given our entitlements right now. But uh, the fact is that that is the real frontier in terms of personalized medicine and you know, targeted therapies, at least from what I've been reading and studying and my own personal experience and as a cancer patient. And the, uh, the next, I guess the place I would like least to go, I remember looking back, when I was 12 years old, I was assigned in sixth grade to look anywhere in the world and do a, a paper. And in finding some of my old things my mother turned up, my paper was on Yemen. Oh, Somehow, this 12-year-old in suburban New York no. was fascinated by Yemen. And I wrote this whole paper and went down to the United Nations and was studying Yemen as a kid. Uh, Yemen is the place I would least like to go to right now. 
which of course is, is, is a tragedy in many ways because it is a fantastic country but tragically ripped apart right now. Ambassador, where would you least like to invest right now? Let me answer the question in a different way. <laughs> you, they've trained you well as a diplomat. <laughs> yeah. That's why he's been ambassador for seven years. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you where I would invest. And I'm telling you what's, what excites me and what fascinates me, partly because of the rate it's growing and partly because I don't understand anything about it, is innovation. The incredible levels and growth of innovation. I was speaking to a senior U.S. official who told me that approximately 30 to 40 percent of all the growth coming out of the United States right now is coming out of innovation. The Googles, the Facebooks, the Ubers, the, all these new technology companies are creating a third of U.S. growth. And for me, that's something we are trying to figure out how it works, how to tap into it, how to send our young people to learn about this. So one of the programs we're doing in the embassy is trying to bring young Emirati entrepreneurs and send them to Silicon Valley for six to nine months of training and embedding and being incubated and then coming back to the UAE to do whatever they need to do. And when I was being briefed on the program, I asked them, I said, why six to nine months? They said, because if you don't succeed and invent something in Silicon Valley in under nine months, you're considered a failure. And I thought that was fascinating. Nine months to invent something and make it succeed. And I think that's the kind of optimism our region needs, and, and right. that's why I would really focus on that. Well, it's certainly a fantastically different picture of the region from the one that tends to dominate the headlines today. I would just ask you, though, Ambassador, um, if you would be sufficiently undiplomatic to say where you wouldn't invest in or what you wouldn't invest in. And I'll also ask that to Dr. Ibrahim and then turn to Darren. I, I wouldn't invest in, in, in countries that don't have good governance. And I'm not going to name individual countries because simp I simply don't know. Uh, there's a reason I'm not in business, because if I was in business, I'd run whatever company I'm running into the ground. I'm, I excel in spending money, not making it. Uh, and so, I want that job. <laughs> so I, I am not your you know, top most expert on which, which economy is the best, but I, I would go where there's transparency, where there's governance, where there's rule of law, right. where there is easy access to capital, and anything that fits that bill, I would go to. Right. Dr. Ibrahim, you have one minute to tell me where you wouldn't invest or what sector you I wouldn't. I fully agree with uh, my friend uh, Ambassador Jamal here. Uh, rule of law. Rule of law is the bedrock of any civil society. If there is no rule of law, you just run like hell. You look around where we don't have rule of law, I think it's obvious. I wouldn't invest in Yemen. I wouldn't invest in Syria. Uh, I wouldn't invest in Ukraine. Uh, you know, there are a few, few, few places where there's conflict or, or uh, Somalia maybe is a problem also. Uh, Libya is a problem now. Wherever there's conflicts and uh, lack of rule of law, this is where we, 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 we don't go. Right. And, uh, Darren. Can I just con connect and link what, what was just said. I think what, what you said, Ambassador, about the role of Silicon Valley in technology and innovation is very important in the American economy. But we must not forget that that is actually not where most of the jobs in the American economy are created. It's sexy, it's media, but it's not. It's regular mom and pop American businesses. And, and we need mechanisms that connect them to markets because the risk assessment of Africa is high. And the idea of investing in Africa for many American investors and businesses is, is very challenging. Now, there are reasons why that we know our fallacies and mythologies about Darren, Africa. Because they think, they think Africa is a country. Well, that's exactly, the problem with that's the exactly right. Leader. That is exactly right. <laughs> Africa has 54 countries. It's because of our own, it is because of, it is because of our own ignorance as Americans. And let's just, let's just stipulate that. But in some ways, and I'm not here to give an endorsement of, of the bank, uh, but I do think this question of risk and how to ensure that more investment goes to Africa, more jobs in the United States and in Africa are created as a result of private investment has to be a priority. Or we're going to continue to find ourselves in this situation where China continues to grow in terms of 
a, a percentage of, of investment there. And that's not a bad thing, but it's not a good thing for American investment to be reduced. Well, I must say that that picture of fire, fire trucks shows that not everything that America sells overseas was invented by Steve Jobs. <laughs> I just want to say a bit about education and both poles of higher education. Uh, I'm a trustee for many years at a major research institution in Philadelphia, the University of Pennsylvania, uh, where we first met. Uh, but most recently in New Hampshire, in Concord, New Hampshire, at the National the uh, New Hampshire Institute of Technology Concord campus, a 2,500 uh, student ca classroom. I was in a lab, a, a robotic lab the other day. I was obviously covering a political campaign. And in talking to the professor and one of the students there, who was a former Marine, avionics technology, studying robotic uh, modeling of yeah. machine part manufacture, this is also the wave of the future, not just the, the patents that we aspire to at our major research institutions, but this young man, after five years in the Marines, two years at this institution, is graduating this year with a job in a laser manufacturing company in Manchester, New Hampshire. Uh, they have an extraordinary job placement record. The tuition is $200 uh, for uh, a credit. Right. And so, th I mean, this whole community college movement and its relationship with the business sector, I think, is a major innovation in American society, in American education, that can only bode well for right. our manufacturing Absolutely. sector. Well, the sign of a great panel debate is when all the panelists at the end are trying to catch my eye to say something else, and we've run out of time. So sadly, we have run out of time. I think it's been a fascinating debate. Um, we've heard about globalization, innovation, the rise of non-state actors, the growth of civil society. I mean, if I have to sum up what we've discussed today, I'd say the single biggest theme is that we're moving into a world where our traditional buckets that we like to classify things into, the silos that we use mentally to organize the world, are breaking down. We are very much moving into an era of silo busting, when our traditional classification systems are fragmenting, which is scary, but also very, very um, exciting too. So it just remains to me to say a very big thank you to all of you for a great conversation, and best of luck to all of you in the room work in working out how to navigate this brave new world. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely.